So the big question is this, how are real estate investors who don't have a ton of free time, don't have access to off-market deals, and didn't start life on third base, how do we grow a real estate business conservatively to support our families, finally leave the corporate rat race and build a legacy? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Ed Matthews, and this is Real Estate Underground. This is the Real Estate Underground podcast show number eight. Hey, everybody, Ed Matthews here with Real Estate Underground, and I am joined today by Adam Bonhoff. Adam, welcome. Thank you so much for your time today. We're really excited to have you. Thank you, Ed. I'm looking forward to the interview. Yeah, fantastic. You and I are just getting to know each other, and I don't know how many people out there know who you are and what you do. Why don't we start there? What's your background, and how'd you get here? I started off as a retail stockbroker, so that's really where I come from. Just to give people a little bit of a flavor of of where I'm coming from, I look at this as we are investors, more than just being a real estate investor, which has been a huge part of my business. Yeah. We're investors. So I think that we really need to look at this from the whole picture, and you need to be able to look at all facets of potential investments more than just real estate Yes, I do real estate. And yes, I think real estate has been historically one of the best ways for the small guy to get his first foot on the rung of the ladder to start gathering wealth and making a steady income on the side while they're trying to build up so that they can maybe get out of that rat race that we all dream of. For me, basically, I started off, I was a retail stockbroker in the 80s. I eventually started my own firm. I had a few partners. I was in Boca Raton. We were Florida financial centers. We had the firm for about three, four years. Ultimately, it didn't go the way I had hoped, but I then went back into being a retail broker with a larger firm, did that probably overall, I was a broker for about 10 years. And then I became a trader. So I went to a prop trading firm and uh, I traded for about three years and I still Mm -hmm. trade today, picked up a lot of things as I did that. I wasn't quite there yet so that I could make that consistent living. So I went and then I expanded. I had my insurance license. I sold insurance while I was trading. Eventually, I left Florida and came back to Connecticut. I'm from Stanford, grew up in Stanford. I went to school there. I went to school in New Haven. I went to Southern Connecticut. And then eventually, when I came back up here, I started working in financial services again. When I first got back up here, I worked for a hedge fund, and then I went into sales with paychecks. I did that for for all about five years. So we sold payroll and human resource services. And while I was at paychecks, I bought my first rental property. Okay. That was probably 2001. At first, it was just a little side thing. I thought I could do it. I wanted to try it. And my wife, she thought, oh, it's one of these another Ralph Cramden ideas that right. it's not going to work big out. One. He's got to do it. Well, anyway, it was fantastic. My very first investment, I was really, I thought, lucky looking back at it because I really didn't know much. The market was a little bit down. It was a little weak. Yep. I bought a three-family house in Shelton, and uh, it was in 2001. It wasn't in the greatest location. It backed up to Route 8. People would come up the driveway. They were potential renters, and they'd be like, no, thank you, with the whole <laughs> loud noise going back and right. forth. But we got right. it rented, and it stayed rented consistently. So I bought that one in 2001. I didn't have a lot of money, and I think I paid about 240 for the property at the time. It needed some work. I did the work. There was an empty unit. I got it rented. And I think I was clearing about $700 a month. That's um, pretty good. Yeah, while I held it. You know, start, yeah. It was fully rented. But at just about that time, the market then spiked and took off. And about three years later, I was able to sell this property. I made 100 I sold it for about 355 Good for you. It was beautiful. And I was saying to myself, I'm still doing the paycheck job. I'm running around, I'm in sales, I'm hustling, and I had to hit the number for the company. They had goals for you month in, month out. But I'm saying to myself, wow, look at this check. Look at this check I got back from my lawyer after I paid off the bank and everything. And I thought, I should be doing more of this. This is more on that one deal than I was making in a year. But before I had sold that one, I had picked up a couple of other properties because at the time you were able to get a HELOC on these rental properties. 
Yeah, that was, so that was good time, right? The price was moving up. I was able to then parlay that and I bought two others before Great. I even sold the, that very first one. At any rate, that got me started. And after I yeah. had about five properties, eventually I was able to leave other businesses, but I didn't fully leave these other businesses until 2010. And that's when I finally let go of it all. But during Burn that, the time, I still sold insurance. Yeah. I left paychecks at one point. I came back to paychecks. All told, I was there like five, six years, maybe. As I said, I sold insurance. I sold Aflac. I sold disability. I sold annuities. So I'm doing all these side hustles. At a certain point, probably in 08, 09, I got involved with a partner and we ended up, we wanted to start getting into some franchising. I knew how to do some types of taxes from the paychecks. I could balance a hundred employee payroll, take it right. from A to B and get it all ready to go. And so I knew how to do that. I knew how to do the tax returns for that. So mm-hmm. I had some background anyway. I had that franchise with the partner for about three years. We ended up selling that, but we decided we wanted to have a bookkeeping service. Could we be the paychecks of bookkeeping was our plan. And ultimately that also didn't work out. We couldn't make the numbers work. It was hard managing. We had a lot of independent contractors doing the books and we really came to find that you couldn't really do it in a cookie cutter way. So you couldn't really be that cost effective doing it that way. But meanwhile, it was adding to my real estate portfolio and I was building up my income and I had set out a goal when I could finally get to 10,000 a month in income that, Hey, I didn't need to really do this regular job every single day. And I could focus on the real estate investing going back. Also, I continued to trade and I had some really good years and gotten better at trading stocks. And I still do it on the phone on Ameritrade and there are great opportunities. And in the last year or two, we've had like unbelievable opportunities in the stock market. And yeah, it's been a good run. You didn't have to be a genius. You just needed to get into something decent and momentum trading really had worked. You didn't, Absolutely. you could find a lot of things. I made a ton of money in Generac over the last few years. That was my, probably my biggest winner. Good um, for you. So I look at this though, as we are not just real estate investors. We need to look at all the different asset classes and you always need to be looking at yep. these different asset classes because absolutely something could be a whole important. lot better. I personally right. think with what happened with the moratorium on an eviction, it really amped up the risk and we never knew when this would end and it still right. hasn't ended to this still day. Hasn't. Right. And we're waiting. Coupled with the fact that probably since January of 2020, If you've had real estate pretty much anywhere in Connecticut, which is not a high growth state, you are up 15, 20% from that, at least from that time frame. So this has been an opportunity to really sell into strength. And it's been a long bull market in real estate all along the way. And at one point during the year in uh, 2020, I had as many as 17 properties. Okay. I sold nine. And I'm not looking at it that, you know, I'm far from done. I enjoy, I love the climb. I enjoy the game and I'll get into doing some other things. I've been seriously in recent years exploring syndication Uh and looking at investing out of state. And I think if you have bigger properties, but you can actually manage those properties, you can bring in investors and you can manage the management team. So yeah. I'm looking forward to being able to do that with a lot more units because you're really Absolutely. having one to six units, which made up the portfolio that I had until now. It's tough to bring on a money manager. You, I mean, right. a property manager. It is. You could, and maybe it makes sense when you're ready to retire, you're going to let that management go, or you need to get to that critical mass. You need to get to that size to justify letting that piece go. Right. And so I'm at that crossroads at this point in my career. Okay. Let's talk about you trading property. So when you're looking at keeping a property versus selling one, I believe you're selling one right now, as a matter of fact, if I heard you right earlier, are you 1031 exchanging into different properties or are you pocketing and paying the taxes? Like what's your strategy there? My feeling is that the market is toppy at this point. And so yeah. since I feel that way, I feel that it makes sense to pay the taxes. And I I mean, it's really hard to pay the taxes. And I had to pay Uncle Sam a lot of money last year, and I'll have to pay a lot of money again this year. And I'm not looking forward to paying all those taxes. So there is a six of one where you're saying to yourself, okay, you need to justify based on your situation. Even if you were going to buy a six cap 
property, say you're going to buy even a, a triple net lease, you're going to buy a Walgreens or a CVS or a Rite Aid yeah. or something, one of these auto retailers or something like yep. that. That six or seven cap that you're buying, maybe it's not so bad because you're going to give away a whole lot of principal to Uncle Sam. You have to weigh it. It's a uh, conversation that I've had with myself and a lot of other people. I have done 1031 before, and I would do it again, I think, in the right circumstance. I'm not saying. Okay. So you spent a lot of time in corporate America, as did I, right? And one of the things that I've seen and witnessed and people I've met over the course of time, there's a lot of dreamers out there, right? There's a lot of people who would love to get into trading stocks, selling insurance, buying and selling real estate. Were you born an entrepreneur or is that something that you fostered and nurtured as you grew up? And the back end of that question is, you know, and what separates guys like you from those dreamers who don't pull the trigger, don't burn the boats and stay in corporate America? wishing they had jumped off and started to buy real estate or some other asset class. I think you have to have an element of being a risk taker. You have to be yeah. willing to take some risk. You need to do your homework and feel confident and trust yourself. I mean, going back to the very beginning, it was interesting. In 1996, when I was still in Florida, a friend of mine had bought the uh, Carlton Sheets no money down system. And yeah, I bought that too. I, I know it Carlton well. Sheets was the king of those Absolutely. cable infomercials. And Ron I must LeGrand. have watched it a thousand times before right. I ate. But anyway, so this friend of mine bought it. It was, I don't Absolutely. know, $200 to get his system. I eventually did end up buying it myself as well. But I got that system from him, but it was more motivational. And in 1996, I drove around when I was in Florida and I never bought anything, but I played yeah. all the cassettes. Back it was back then when you had the cassettes, you didn't even have a DVD. Right. Or, right. you know, a CD. And I played that over and over again, drilled it into my head as I was, but I didn't do anything until I got back to Connecticut. So when I got the job with the hedge fund, the end of 99, I'm driving around all the different neighborhoods. I was living in Stratford at the time, and I'm driving all the different Bridgeport and Shelton and Stratford and all the areas yeah. right in that immediate area looking for my first one. And I remember there were times when I felt like the door was welded shut to my car and I couldn't open it because I was just too afraid to swing at the pitch and take a shot. And eventually I did. And I got that three family that turned out to be a big winner for me. But it's interesting because you, you gotta, you've got to push yourself and get out of the comfort zone. And yeah. I'm going to have to do it again now. I have the small deal thing down. It's no longer... A super big challenge and not that I shouldn't right. do more of it again at some point because I think that it's uh, maybe a less efficient market than the bigger stuff yep. uh, and, you, and yep. you have maybe more opportunity. So it sounds like you're going up market and looking at much larger opportunities as you move forward. So given your background on Wall Street and working with big insurance and corporate America, where are you getting your money? Are you focused on Banks, hard money lenders, institutional money, where are you finding the money to fund these beyond obviously your own pocket? Well, I borrowed money from uh, mom and dad early on. Yeah. I also had some money and then I, and I took advantage of whatever programs there were. Mm -hmm. Early on, you could buy an investment property with 10% down. So I was able to buy that $250,000 property, only needed $25,000. So it was easier. I mean, of course, sometimes... If you don't have a lot of equity in the property, it's tougher to get a good return. And it's definitely easier when you do have a war chest to go out and buy. But I still think you need Absolutely. to stay rigidly to your formula and you can't ever let money just burn a hole in your pocket. I think that's a big mistake. And a lot of people may make that mistake. Yeah. So yeah. trying to chase yield right now is pretty, pretty tough. tough. People right. are looking to get an interest rate. Where do you go? What do you do now? Things look toppy in a lot of different areas. And Absolutely. there is nothing leaving your money in a CD. It doesn't make any sense at this point. You, you should at least be liquid. Why tie up something for under a point? <laughs> it's, right. It's crazy. Without a doubt. So do you find yourself working with folks who are looking to deploy capital from their IRA or savings accounts, CDs? Is that, well, is that one of the In recent years, I was referred to one large investor in particular mm -hmm. who I knew him through somebody else. And so I've done like three deals with him so far. It's interesting because he was pushing me because he had more money on the sidelines and he's been pushing me to do more. 
but I haven't been able to justify it to, in, in my mind. What has made me the money on some of my best deals, those situations I'm not seeing right now. Yeah, it's pretty down tough. In markets, in down markets are when you're really going to find your best opportunities in real estate. I mean, it's almost like Warren Buffett thing in a way, and I'm not comparing myself to him because I'm peanuts, small time, not even a fly on his back, but I'm saying, but trying to stay with that same type of a value type of plan. If the property right. doesn't cash flow from day one and decently, then I don't want it. Why get Couldn't involved? More. If you can't make a decent return just to make 200 bucks a month on some property, it's going to most likely get eaten up. You're going to have to do a hot water heater or yeah, you know, one break fix or one vacancy and, right. and that's gone. And you're negative. You're negative. Right. Exactly. Right. They raise the so, taxes on the property. There it is. Yeah, exactly. So Adam, you had mentioned when we were talking before we came on here, your approach is a little bit different than the average guy like me. How do you evaluate a property and what are you looking for when you're buying one? I've had my best situations. I haven't really been really that Burr guy, the guy uh, who's everybody knows that acronym where you're right. buying, repairing, and, and renting, having, refinancing, renting, renting and then renting. repeating. Right. All that stuff. right. So I've more or less looked for something where maybe there were very low rents, maybe a neighborhood was changing. And maybe I could see the future a little bit. And maybe that there was some opportunity where I, I, a lot of times I bought something and I didn't really have to do a lot of work to it. I looked and over the years, so I buy one or two a year. I didn't really sell that often. I was able to get a value and right. um, I was able to really take advantage of it. I can take you through some of what that looks like and some of the ones I still have now. That'd be great. Yeah, let's walk through one of them. Okay. so. Years ago, I met a guy who had a lot more property than I did, and I met him at a CT RIA meeting in late 2003, okay. 2004, when I first joined CT RIA. I don't know what the exact date that they started, but they were, you know, yeah, so three. nothing like they are now. There was interest, but there were people doing it, and they had, you know, an annual thing every year and whatnot. Well, anyway, so I met this guy. And we used to have lunch probably once a month. And this guy was really taking shots and he was a risk taker and he built up his portfolio quick and he probably had two or three times what I had. But then 2007 came and he had been unlucky. He had been the money guy and he bought like four huge empty mansions in Bridgeport. <laughs> and uh, oh so he had some really good stuff. And he started to work and he was going to rehab all these properties yep. and he had, was going to leave his corporate job, this guy, and he, he was a handy guy. Anyway, long story short, he got into trouble and then the market started to top and then things started to slide. And oh, these boy. mansions that he was had big mortgages on, he was in trouble and he needed to try to raise cash. I knew what portfolio he had and he said, you're interested in anything and I, there was a property which was right across the street from the Payne Whitney gym at Yale okay. on Lake Place. And what happened was at that time, the not so great neighborhoods were beginning to encroach on Yale. And there was a lot of low income housing, in fact, even on that street. Yep. And a lot of those houses needed renovation. But there was just uh, at that time, there were a few students that were renting on that street, not many. But basically, I thought that, hey, I knew I could cash flow based on the price that I was going to pay him. And I thought that, that this neighborhood could turn around. And mm -hmm. so I was cash flowing. I think I was getting like 38, 3900 on a three family house over there at that time. Nice, nice brick house. Didn't need yeah. a lot of work. And I had all these students in there. And eventually, I was able to start raising the rents. Mm -hmm. And now I'm getting $7,500 a month on those on that property from the 38. I got an offer. So fast forwarding, uh, I was able to buy one of my neighbor's properties simply by staying on them, asking, would they be interested in selling? And somebody else sold right. out to me at a, actually about five years later at a very similar price. So now I had these two. In 2019, this commercial guy said, I can get you, I have these New York investors. I could get you 2.1 for these right now. And I didn't sell because you know what? I've been able to continuously raise the rent. These properties, they're older. I've been able to maintain them. I've yeah. you know, continuously upgraded them. I probably have paid, I don't know, 750 for the 760 for the package of those two properties. 
And in fact, I was able to refinance those properties like two years ago together on one commercial loan. And so now I owe about 1.07 on those properties, but I pulled out 450,000 and I still- Tax-free, right? And I still That's clear a beautiful thousand thing. a month on the properties. So. Good for you. So That's I mean, even after, even after all that. So that's been like a long home run for me. Absolutely. So I think in the next five years, instead of getting 2,500 a month per unit, I'll be able to get, I think we'll be up to about 3000 a month. I think that's wow. very realistic based on the way things have gone. Sure. So one of the other things I, because I'm across the street from the gym over there, I said to myself, self, uh-huh. wouldn't it be great if I could get sports teams to live in these properties, then I could create a legacy. Yeah. Cause then I don't have to go out and do the traditional marketing. I mean, one of the things about doing student housing, which I do a lot of, is that they turn over more frequently than a regular market rate type of a property. Buying investment real estate is both thrilling and sometimes stressful. Without a lending expert by your side, most investors don't stand a chance. That's where CT Rea Funding comes in. CT Rea Funding was founded by investors to help investors just like you fund their deals. Whether you're buying a single family rehab, an apartment building, or really any investment property, our team will understand your deal and help you close quickly. Go to ctreiafunding.com or call us at 860-876-0572. So the folks that don't understand the student housing and how that works, why don't you walk through how that model works? Basically, they do turn over quite a bit. So every year or two, I'm turning them over. But I shouldn't even say that it's not exactly you develop systems and I've developed a whole bunch of systems. So I've had an apartment five, six years, started off with one group of people. And then I allow them to do a sublet. So then they have to qualify the people who are coming in. And then I just basically add them to the lease and I'll let somebody else who's moving on, move on. So by Mm -hmm. the time that particular apartment ended up before I even had to turn it over again, completely, there's nobody with the same, nobody was the same anymore on that that apartment. So it's not like I had to spend a ton of money on the turnover. And and one of the other beautiful things about doing this is you're able to line it up way ahead of time. So I'll start marketing these properties. So I have no gap. In fact, on those two properties, one month, one year and 15 years, 13 years, one year, I screwed up on one apartment and I had, I, I had it vacant for one month. And that's a screw up. That's and that fantastic. Was my, I screwed it up. I screwed right. it up. You know, I, right. I messed up my timing and whatnot. So that was really beautiful. It certainly is. Yeah. I'm going to give you another example of something I did. Actually, I bought this property with Investor. So I bought this property for $1.3 million in Worcester Square. And it's a six-unit building. It had been rehabbed. So I bought it from a rehabber. In fact, a mm-hmm. lot of times, some of the best stuff I bought was from a rehabber, but I knew that the rents were way low. This guy was only interested, I think he paid 750 for the building. He probably put in another 300. So he did all the windows, the kitchens, everything. This guy did everything, put in new HVAC, air conditioning. So now these are really beautiful upscale apartments. So right now I'm partially into this, into my turnaround of the numbers. This building has 18 bedrooms and 10 bathrooms in it. And the apartments on the first floor units, they're four beds, two bath. The second floor units are like two bedrooms, one bath. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're you know considerably smaller. And the third floor is three beds, two baths in each mm-hmm. one of those. When I first bought that building, the rent roll was about 10-7. And now I've only had it two years and obviously went through COVID and all this other stuff. So it, it's been more challenging, but I finally had turnover And I was able to get all these people that work at the hospital or in the medical program over at Yale New Haven. Mm -hmm. And so on the third floor, I'm now getting 28 on one, 2,800, and I'm getting 2,600 on the other. The middle floors are in the 16 range. They haven't really changed. They were, I thought, fairly priced. I mean, maybe I can go up another 100, but they're not big units. I ended up stuck a uh, rehabber had put in this guy who was doing the an Airbnb kind of a format, so a corporate rental. So he right. just you know, three, six months with people, furnish rental, and I'm only getting in the 1900s on that. But I know I can get 3200 If he left today, I could get 3200 but I'm stuck with him for a few more years. 
Yeah. So I can easily see that I'll have the rents up to 16 Good for you. goes. So that's phenomenal. Yeah. And so obviously the multiple, what is this thing really worth? I paid 1.3. I believe it's worth two when I get the rents to where they should be. Right. Yeah. Huge that, win. That's, that's another example. But it's interesting right. too. I always believe that if you buy right, you're half sold. This is true on stocks and this is true on real estate. If you bought right, it's interesting. But I look at the cycle analysis, if you do a little bit of a cycle analysis, so something that one of the books you were asking me, where did I yeah, get some yeah. of these ideas? Dave Lindahl, who has had, he's got a little bit of a checkered past right now, but he had some good yeah. ideas. I had gotten his Apartment House Riches yeah. boot camp, and then he did an, this book on a cycle analysis thing. He did a follow-on mm -hmm. thing. He was talking about the market surge in real estate are long, slow, 18-year from the trough to the peak. And from the peak to the trough. Right, right. So, I mean, I, I mean right. like some of the properties that I'm selling right now that I bought in 06, I cash flowed. I probably made 12, 15% on them. I'm not killing it on the price. I paid close to the top of the last cycle. Yeah. And even now, 15 years later, selling some of those properties, I'm not making a big, huge cap gain on those. But right. then looking at some of the things that I bought when the market had cratered and there was no buyers and there was... Tough to get financing and everything else. So uh, in Shelton, I bought, I had a four unit in Shelton that I sold this year. And uh -huh. I paid 410 for this unit, for this building. I did fine with it. Again, I didn't kill it, but I made decent money on it. Um, mm -hmm. But I ended up selling it for just about the same as I bought it. But then in the, same, in the same town, same similar quality, same tenants within half a mile, I was able to buy this property uh, for 250000 a three-family. Yeah. So this is in 2012. I bought one for, you know, three. This thing had been in a fire. It had been rehabbed. The insurance money went in. It needed nothing when I bought it. And in fact, the seller had inherited it. Her brother had owned the house. and Her brother had killed it in vitamins or something like that. This guy had, like, okay. had his own vitamin company and killed it. All right. So these people just ended up as not really wanting to be landlords. They just wanted to sell it and make the money liquid. And so I felt that the property was worth, and I had, I was going to pay 272. I remember I was going to pay 272. This is 2012. So at that time there were no sales going on, nothing was going on. And the appraiser came in and he said, I looked everywhere. There's nothing to compare it to. I can't really compare it to Trumbull. I can't really compare it to Stratford. So I'm going to have to put a value on this of 250. And at the time, they had upped the ante. You had to put 30% down oh. at that point. So I said to the seller, I said, look, I'm not going to put it up, coming up with another 22,000. I got to put 30% down. I'll pay you what it appraises for. And they came back to me after a day or two and said, you know what? Okay. Burn the hand, right? I bought it for two fifty. I sold that property in January for four twenty two. Good. So on. I had That's... the thing for eight years. Yeah. And I made about thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars a month on the property. Well, every month while I had it, and then I sold it for four twenty two. There is an example of the same kind of a thing. Absolutely. You know, that I'm that I'm talking about. Some of the other things that I noticed, it, it was interesting. There was a guy who was advertising, this is probably about 2012, 13, 14. He was advertising that he was going to sell these three two-family houses. They were all in a row in Hamden. And he wanted to get, I don't know, 1.5 for these properties. And I'm saying, so I looked at them all. The thing about it was he was renting the college students. He was renting at Quinnipiac. Okay. And I drove past the property. I never even went in. They were really in rough shape. And he was making some unbelievable number. The cash itself justified the price because you were buying a business, but the market value, I mean, like you would be killed on the market value if you ever needed to sell. So I never bought from him, but that gave me the idea. So I said, all right. I started looking around in, in Hamden, driving everywhere, this, that, and the other thing. And I talking to different people. And so I began to understand what was going on there. Long story short, I ended up, I had five of them at one point. I've since sold off three. I've made decent money selling those other ones off, but I was making great money on a four bedroom, two bath, 1600 square foot house. I'm making 13, 1400 bucks a month. Didn't even have to really redo anything. 
not much because a lot of times you bought these properties from somebody who was living in the house who cared a whole lot more than they weren't getting beaten up by renters. I was able to do fantastic with that. You had to jump through some hoops up there, getting student housing mm-hmm. permits with, through the town. And there's a lot of right. pissing matches going on. And the neighbors didn't like having students in the neighborhoods. But at any rate, it's great for me. I still have some of them. Again, looking for something like there was an undervalued situation. It was a change of use. I could see an opportunity. There weren't nearly as many people now. There's a lot of other people that have gotten the permits in recent years. So the market's getting a little bit tougher up there. Once everybody thinks it's a great idea, it's probably not as great an idea anymore. Right. Supply curve changes. You got to start looking at it, right? Right. And the university is now even made it so that juniors can't live off campus. So that's taking some juice out right. of it. But I'm simply saying, so I've been taking some chips off the table all during this last year and a half, and I don't regret anything I've sold. I think there'll be opportunity again. You just have to keep your eyes out. And um, Absolutely, without a doubt. So you mentioned Dave Lindahl's book. I'm curious from a real estate perspective, what about a business book, a straight up business book, given your background, what's been the most impactful for you? There's a couple of books that I really love. And again, I look at it in valuing a business and also in in looking at if you have any extra money, okay, more than what you need to pay your current bills, what you do with that extra money is investing. So whether you throw it in the bank, you stuff it in the mattress, you've made a conscious decision. You're an investor just because you have this extra surplus, So what you've decided to do with that, you need to keep it in mind. There was a great book that was written in the 30s called The Battle for Investment Survival. It was written by Gerald Loeb, who was a partner in what had become Shears and Lehman Brothers. Okay. So that's a fantastic book. I would recommend it to anybody who's interested in investing and just generally getting to thinking right, getting your mind right. Another book that I thought was really, you know, that I got turned on to, I don't know, 10 years ago was The E-Myth Revisited. I don't yeah, know if you've Gerber. It. Yeah, I know him. Well. I know it. I know the book. Yeah, that's well, a great the series book well. his gist is you're talking about don't work in your business, work on your business. It's like the Robert Kiyosaki type of thing. Not, I can't afford it, but how can I afford it? So I think you need to think about how can I afford this? How can I leverage myself? How can I incentivize somebody else to do those things, take care of those properties or whatever it is, run that business for you so that you're working on the marketing, you're working on finding the next investment, you're working on whatever, but you're not spending all your time doing the minutiae. You're not cutting your own lawn. You're not the guy who's bringing in the refrigerator. You're, you know, I'm saying you're not the guy who's turning over your apartments. If you've got a turn over your apartments, you probably didn't build in enough margin when you did your numbers because at a certain point, and I painted plenty of apartments and I did a lot of early on and I handy enough, but I can't do any of the real skill stuff that a lot of these other people can do. But why would you, right? It's not where the money is. It comes down to your highest and best use, right? Exactly. You couldn't have said Where do you bring value? So those are probably two of the best books and some of the other ones, Think and Grow Rich, because the idea, where is the money made? It's, it's made right here. You see it first. You figured out a way to create it. That's where the money was made. It wasn't in when you actually just went out and did it. Some of the other things that are maybe a little bit different, you know, I think a lot of people, especially when they're new and I, when I was first trying to break in, I would get those MLS sheets on a three-family house from some realtor. Yeah. But you realize so it's got the projections in there. You can make thirteen hundred a month on floor right. one, two, three, and for, you're only for sure. you know, two hundred thousand for this property. So God, this is good. How can this not be good, right? You're buying this in a place where it's stagnant. Nothing good is happening in this area. The neighborhoods are rough. Right. They're selling it for a reason, right? Yeah. It's selling for that, you know, for a reason. The fact of the matter is even pre-COVID, when you were allowed to evict, you were always going to have a vacant unit in that house. You were always going to be evicting somebody. You're never going to be able to find a quality tenant to put into one of these properties. So it's not worth the aggravation. Or if you do, if you're going to stick to your guidelines, 
but you're going to have to talk to 60, 70 people to find somebody with decent credit to rent that apartment. And yeah. how aggravating is that to have to go through that minutia and not worth it? You know, looking at the student rentals that I have, I'm not renting it to the students. Oh, you're renting to mom and dad. I'm renting it to mom and dad. And mom and dad have 700 plus credit scores and they right. got $150,000 plus jobs and they've never missed a payment and they're 55 right. years right. old and they're not going to ruin their credit over the $800 that little Susie has to pay to, for her portion of the rent. So I will do like a guarantee letter with the tenant sign a joint and several <clears throat> lease yep. saying that we are all jointly and severally responsible for the performance of this property for no damage, this any other thing. The parents send me a letter which basically says that, that they owe me everything in, in, in their whole life if this <laughs> right. doesn't perform. And they sign it. Sometimes they begrudgingly, <clears throat> they call me up, I can't sign this, but I'm like, look. Then don't sign it. And then I'll have to go with somebody else. What am I going right. to do? You know what I'm saying? Because I can't run the risk that, and so it gets signed. But it's interesting. I would look at it differently than a lot of other people. A lot of people are looking at it from what is the financing angle? I want to get into a deal and it's all about how do I finance this thing? If I can get Mm -hmm. this thing because I'm going to get the owner to take back a note and I'm going to not come out of pocket and there's a seller second and a lease to own and this and that just to get in. So they're focusing on the financing. And I think that's Mm -hmm. probably the majority of the investors. How do I get in as cheaply as possible? Well, I'm not looking at that at all. I'm looking at, I want that property over there. That's the one I want. I like that property. And I know that I'll always have a line of potential tenants. So I would even pay up a little sometimes if I felt that was meeting my criteria. So I just was far less concerned about just getting into the deal. Right. And of course I played with this, but this is like something that I've developed over the years because I don't need to do it. And I'm saying now I'm in a much stronger position than I was when I was hustling. Absolutely. Uh, doing these other jobs. Right. So, You've covered a lot of ground here today. And I know from your network and the folks that have been your mentors and the folks that have taken a vested interest in your business, what's the best advice you ever got and, and who gave it to you? I belong to the Greater Bridgeport Property Owners Association, and um, there's a lot of older guys, probably 15, 20 years older than I am, and not that I'm young anymore, but (laughs) one guy said to me, Eds and Meds. He didn't say anything more than that. He just said, Eds and Meds. Think about it. Basically, buy your properties around a a hospital or buy your properties around a university. Gotcha. So that was was what- not genius, just like focusing on where are you going to find, you're going to yeah. get quality renters. If they're working at the hospital, chances are they're not poor. And then it's mom and dad at the university, really. Right. Chances are they're not poor, right? And chances are they're not poor, especially if they're Smart. going to Quinnipiac and spending 60000 a year. Those people actually, on average, are wealthier than the people at Yale. There are some very wealthy people at Yale, don't get me wrong, but you're going to get, you also get a lot of students that may be getting like rides from the university that may be underprivileged or so you've got sure. some mixture there. Sure. At Quinnipiac, there's none of that. Right. Yeah. They you can know. all afford to be there. Yeah. It's interesting right. too. Like when you're crunching numbers, like I live in Easton and I'm a mile from Sacred Heart. Okay. Sacred Heart is very much the same makeup of Quinnipiac. In fact, they're okay. almost like parallel universities as far as growth. They're both extremely successful. They're north of 10,000 students now, and they were much smaller. Sure. But Sacred Heart is right on the border of Fairfield, and Fairfield is extremely pricey, and you're not going to be able to find numbers that work. But then on the other side, just across the street on Park Avenue, you're now on the Bridgeport side, so you're between the university and you're also... And the mall, let's say, the uh, Trumbull Mall. Right. Yep. So in that section right there, that's where you want to be. But the prices on those properties are 25% more, or at least they were when I was buying for Quinnipiac. So I'd drive 30 minutes and I can get the exact same numbers for the rent. It's not going to be any different. Plus there was like way less, like all those properties in that area where everybody wanted to be had a, were already appreciated yeah. considerably more. It was a tighter market. Fantastic. So we've talked a lot of business. I'm curious when you're not chasing deals, 
what else do you like to do? What are your hobbies? Who do you hang out with? I like sports. Like I'm getting ready for my fantasy football draft in yeah. another week. So we play every year. I have the same group of guys. We've been doing it now for 15 years. And That's great. Uh, not that there's a lot of money in it, but it's just a Man. it's just a kick. Bragging rights. It's, just, right. it's just a thrill to on the, on Sunday when all these players are doing uh, having great games. It's exciting. Yeah. And I like to work out and I like riding my bike a lot with my wife. Now she's even more of an athlete than I am. She was never doing it, but in the last couple of years, she's really started to do that. Fantastic. Yeah. So Fun. Do that. All right. Well, hey, if people out there want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what's the best way to do that? Well, you know, somebody could contact me, but something that we didn't talk about at all is I run the Connecticut Landlord Investor page on Facebook. I'm the moderator, Dave Haberfield, who's actually the founder of this page. And he basically said to me, Adam, if you want to really go wild here, then do right. it. So I've been moderating this page and we've grown it. We have 2,800 members. I think a lot of people probably Standing. want to see Tiaria and other people around the state. And it's all... We're not a standard, like there's probably 10, 15 pages on Facebook related to investing in real estate. And sure. our focus is really on the regulation and what's coming out of Hartford and what's going to affect our industry. And so mm. that's really our focus. We wanted to shine a light on it. And when thing, bills are coming out that may be unfavorable to real estate, we are able to like beat the drum, contact your legislator, tell them you want this, you don't want this. And I think it's helped somewhat. And I encourage anybody, you know, if somebody wants to IM me on Facebook, they could. And what was the organization again? And how do they find you on it's, Facebook? It's CT Landlord and Investor page on okay. Facebook. Excellent. Um, so you, if you go on there and you just want to apply and I ask three pretty easy qualifying questions, but we're looking for people that are investors, particularly in real estate, or they sell to the real estate industry. They, okay. They're a lawyer, they're a contractor, they're a real estate agent, wannabe, somebody who right. is trying to break in. Maybe they inherited a property from their family, or they have one unit or whatever, and right. they're just trying to, to grow. Trying to figure out. Yep. Okay. Fantastic. So Adam Bonoff, thank you so much for your time today. This was a wealth of information. All right, thanks. This has been the Real Estate Underground Podcast, a CT RIA presentation. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, and share this podcast with your friends. If there's a specific topic you want us to cover, post it in the comments. For more information on the Real Estate Underground Podcast or CT RIA, go to realestateundergroundpodcast.com or ctria.com. Until next time, happy investing. This has been the Real Estate Underground. Don't forget to subscribe. It helps us grow. Until next time, undergrounders, remember your real estate journey begins with a simple step forward. Now get to it. Bye for now.